Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. Welcome to another Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Leon Moriarty, who joins us from Australia, and Saya Rankin in Los Angeles. They'll discuss Leon's new novel, Apples Never Fall. Leon is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Big Little Lies, The Husband's Secret, Truly Madly Guilty, Nine Perfect Strangers, What Alice Forgot, the Last Anniversary, The Hypnotist's Love Story, and Three Wishes. Saya Rankin is the book's editor at Entertainment Weekly, where she covers everything from literary fiction to celebrity memoirs. Take it from here, Saya. Hello, everybody. Hi, Leon. Hi, Saya. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Um, so I thought, I mean, I have so many questions for you, but I thought we'd start off. I would love to hear um, your kind of elevator pitch for this new novel. Um, I obviously have many ways in which I could describe it, but I'm so curious kind of like what your, <laughs> what your little thesis is on what the book is about. I'd, actually, I'd love to hear yours because I'll probably steal it if it's better than, <laughs> better than mine, especially because this is in the very early days of um, talking about the book. But at the moment, I've been saying it's the story of uh, Joy and Stan Delaney, who are retired tennis coaches and what happens when Joy goes missing and her four adult children have to deal with the terrible possibility that their father may have murdered their mother. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about uh, secrets and sibling rivalry and deception and betrayal and tennis. Mm -hmm. Um, not to plug my own magazine, but of course I'm here, I'm the books editor of Entertainment Weekly, and I believe what we use to kind of tease, we had the first serial of the novel and we just set, called it Game, Set, Murder, question mark? Uh, <laughs> I so love it. Want, if you ever want to steal that. I that. might steal that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm so curious, kind of, you've obviously written so many books and so many captivating stories how in general like do ideas come to you like do they kind of like hit you as you're out living your life or do you have to sit down and kind of craft what your next book is going to be about or what's your process there uh, so they come from all different places so yes definitely when i'm out and about in life so things that i read um things that people say to me things that i hear uh, podcasts like <clears throat> Joy in the Book, who listens to podcasts. Uh, she was given some fancy headphones by her husband, Stan, which is exactly <clears throat> what happened to me. So that's when I got into podcasts. Uh, mm. I got into a lot of true crime podcasts, uh, um, like most people. Uh, so, yeah, all out and about everywhere. And what do you have? Do you write them down? Do you have an ideas notebook that I'm sure would be worth? millions of dollars by now or <laughs> how does it go from something like that happening to actually a book idea I find actually that I don't write things down as often as uh as you would think um because if I write it down if often if I look back at it it's not as good as I as I thought it was uh, mm -hmm. I I feel if I keep thinking about it if I keep returning to that idea then it's a good idea Mm. So in this case, the particular premise really was just how would you feel if you thought your father had murdered your mother? Uh, mm. And that's what I kept coming back to. Um, yeah, so often if I have an idea in the middle of the night and I think I must write that down, if I look at it the next morning, it's no good. It's not as, <laughs> as wonderful as I thought, as I thought it was. <laughs> Do you remember when you first asked yourself the question of what would that feel like if uh, you thought your father murdered your mother? Uh, yeah, early, 
yes, that, so that must have been quite a while ago. And I did keep returning to it and then thinking about your siblings because, of mm -hmm. course, that allowed you then to think, well, I might think this way, but then somebody else might think another way uh, and all the, the conflict there. Yeah, I wanted to ask you too kind of about a lot of your books obviously follow families and what is your like decision making process in how to create those families kind of what the makeup of the central family should be and specifically in, in apples never fall obviously there's four adult siblings which is not so unusual you know these like it's not very usual these days um but they each play such a specific part so yeah kind of how do you decide how do you build out what the family is going to be I don't know. I'm the I'm the eldest of six, so to me, a family of four doesn't doesn't <laughs> seem that big. Um, and I just I I never plan my book, so I just start writing. So I can't actually remember if I ever thought I'll have four children. Um, it just seemed to end up that way. So so I don't. It's really I've. Um, since I've started writing, I've tried to become more aware of what I'm doing because I know I'll get these questions at the end. So I try to notice myself, but I can't remember. I honestly can't remember how I came up with um, with these four. Except I do know I had Amy uh, as a character, and originally she was the youngest of the siblings. And I remember thinking, I wonder if I'm just calling her Amy because of Little Women. Uh, and she's the youngest <laughs> child so I made her then um, the, the older child and then of course my editor is Amy uh, and I was thinking why am I calling her Amy Amy will think it's her um, but then it was her name had stuck it was too late she was Amy by then mm. do you ever use um in like actually direct inspiration from from your personal life or from people you know like that or are they all kind of an amalgamation of, oh, of things you yes say? definitely an amalgamation so I I always say that um I often will take a particular attribute but never an entire personality mm -hmm. so I always remember with the character in Big Little Lies of Madeline I can remember writing down perpetually outraged like so and so uh mm -hmm. and then a glamorous sort of shimmery person like so-and-so and, -so. and mm. then I had those two attributes and then the character of Madeline was actually in the end nothing like either of those two people she was so, through there is some sort of magical process where she, uh, the characters become themselves. Mm. That makes so much sense do you remember any of those attributes that you kind of combined for any of the characters in Apples Never Fall? Um, let me think yeah, it's always, uh, no, I remember Brooke, have, uh, so Brooke is the youngest child, and I do remember, because I'd read an article about uh, somebody with migraines, so I decided mm -hmm. I would give this character migraines, uh, and then that seemed to, <coughs> excuse me, to, to affect her character because of what she had to go through in her mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, and also I do remember again, because she was the youngest child uh, and thinking I'll flip it and make her the more organized, efficient. So give her some of the characteristics that you'd normally think of as belonging to the eldest child. Uh, I can't, no, I can't remember any of the others. Um, I wanted to also talk about tennis. Tennis mm -hmm. is a very large part of the book. Um, for those who don't know the Joy and Stan own a tennis training facility there they were tennis stars the children are all very into tennis I also played tennis um, competitively when I was growing up so yeah. I, oh. I really liked that but did you I mean do you play tennis kind of where did that where did that come from uh, so growing up we did tennis was part of our lives but only in a recreational sense so um, my mother was part of a tennis club my grandmother was part of a tennis club um, she was still you know into her 70s and 80s even though she couldn't move about the court much, she could still beat us um, standing in one spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and whenever we'd, if we had a picnic somewhere, we'd hire a tennis court. I mean, I mean we'd make it somewhere where there were, there were tennis courts nearby, so that would be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but not competitive tennis. Um, but then my son actually has got quite good at tennis. And so I was having a tennis lesson trying to keep up 
with him, which <laughs> I have not achieved. Uh, so he's, he's only 13 and it's got really good. Uh, and I remember at the time I, when I was writing Apples Never Fall, I was thinking to myself, it would be quite good to have my characters run a family business really for the sake of convenience because it meant I could keep the characters all in one spot. So I thought, as I was having this tennis lesson, I thought, I know I'll make them run a tennis school. And then it was funny because then I thought, okay, well, I guess if they're running a tennis school, I guess they're really into tennis. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's sort of that, all that thinking just slowly came to me that I can't just make that, you know, push that aside. Then, and then it became a really important start part of the story because then I started interviewing people, um, former tennis players, uh, and that's when I, I learned about the level of sacrifice that goes into tennis. And mm -hmm. that's when I started thinking about, so what if you do have the talent? What if you have the talent? What if you have the dedication, but you don't make it? What happens then? And so that then became an important part of the story. I'm, I'm also like uh, cognizant of the fact that I'm reading this book as an American. And mm -hmm. I feel like Americans have a very specific relationship to competitive sports, specifically like passed down from generations, you know, a, a parent like Stan Delaney, if you were mm -hmm. written in the States would maybe be a little bit more, I mean, aggressive isn't right, the right word, but you know, the, uh, the level of like him not having made it and then putting that onto his children would be so strong to the point where sometimes you could read that and almost dislike the character. And I think it had such a good balance, but that's probably because I don't know, are maybe people more realistic when it comes to competitive sports and children in Australia or <laughs> what's. I don't, yeah, I don't know if that's the case. Um... Or if I could have, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily uh, an Australian versus uh, uh, US way of thinking. Uh, ten tennis was, um, yeah, but that's not really what you're saying. Saying so if they, if the, you know, a really competitive tennis player, I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to that question. But it, it is interesting that it, it's also a sport that allows you to play so long, and so you are able to kind of have the parents and the children like still play each other. I loved all of the descriptions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the husband and wife too. I think another, it's another sport where you can across like genders, you can really com you can compete, compete at like the exact same level or women can be better. And exactly. um, you don't often get a place where you're just like, you're not putting football players again, like other sports don't really. No, that's that. true. Yes. So were, were you a high level? Um, you know, I, I didn't play in college. So here it's like in college. Um, yeah. so I guess I wouldn't describe myself as a high level, but I was like just varsity in high school. Um, oh, and things like pretty that. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yes, yeah, good for that, for that period of time. Um, and then in college, it kind of, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. living in New York city will really, uh, kill your <laughs> dedication to playing tennis because it's so hard. Yes. Um, well, see, that is the thing here that, um, Tennis was a part of a lot of people's lives, especially for my, um, and, you know, people without much money um, because there were um, big backyards. So my father, who had um, a very working class sort of life, but they did have a tennis court in their backyard. That, uh, and I did give that to Stan, that, his own, that my dad's dad had actually um, built. Um, so there was, yeah, not as much these days, but um, a big part of our lives. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm catching myself because you're a tennis player, so I want to take information from you. It's too late. The book's it was, done. I I know, and it was all, it was, no, it was all written very realistically. Oh, yeah. um, when you have your books, do you find, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't imagine that you have favorite characters, but do you categorize characters as either, like, this person is, do you see them as a villain or a hero of the story? Or do you see kind of like flaws or things like that? Or how do you, how are you relating to your characters, especially as some of them are kind of like for the purpose of a very good story, making some decisions that maybe wouldn't be like the best, <laughs> the best decisions. I, yes. I, I, uh, I definitely don't think of them as heroes or of villains, uh, I try to find a little part of myself in every, in every character, uh, and each time, because I do switch perspectives 
-hmm. a lot. Uh, and sometimes if I've been writing in one character's perspective, then it's quite nice. I, I, I do sometimes think, oh, it's nice to be back with so-and-so. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, yeah, I just have to... I just have to feel, yeah, so I do think every single character has some tiny piece of myself. Uh, or any, and even by, <clears throat> by writing them, I get to know them. So I always remember with Nine Perfect Strangers with the character of Jessica, who's somebody um, who's very uh, obsessed with her own appearance mm -hmm. uh, and is, is an influencer. And I found it interesting by writing her in the, in the beginning I was almost um, making fun of her. But as I wrote her, I developed so much more sympathy just by inhabiting her. Mm, that makes sense. And then I, I think that really translated to the screen to like after I read the book, I left off the book with sympathy. So then when I started watching the show, I kind of entered the show as a viewer with immediate sympathy for her because I knew yeah, her backstory. But I'd love to talk to people. I should talk to more people who haven't read the book and who are watching the show and see kind of at see what they think. Yeah. Well, the actress um, Samara who played that role, I thought she did such a beautiful job of showing her vulnerability. Uh, yeah, although the the show actually went in a slightly different uh, direction there. That I think um, in in my um, in the book I had her. She just loved the way she looked, whereas um, and her and you know they'd won the lottery, so she changed everything about herself. And her um, her husband didn't like the changes that she'd made. Whereas I think in the show they've done more that she she actually still she hates the way she looks. So they've gone a slightly different direction I love both characters so. mm -hmm. is is it what is the experience like of seeing like your stories that really just originated in your own mind and like that you sat with for so long being kind of translated I think the best adaptations do grow the story from the book to the page and that is what happens with all of yours but as the as the creator what is the feeling of seeing that kind of transformation uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that that's what that an adaptation should never be just um, here's the book and now we um, uh, what's the word truthful now you know that word uh, faithfully you know a faithful adaptation mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. exactly what was on the on the page because the fact is that every single uh, actor every single member of the cast brings something of themselves in the same way that I bring little parts of myself I I think I've learned from watching actors that they sort of create a character in exactly the same way that I do, but it's all little parts of their own, mm. you know, people they know probably and little gestures that they've seen. Um, so it's, it's surreal and wonderful, but also in a way I do feel slightly detached because of that. So I, in a way I just enjoy watching it without holding on too tightly to my own characters. I always think that would be a mistake if I, if I started watching and and, th and then immediately thought, well, they've changed this, they've changed that, that's not exactly the way I imagined it. And also because I do think readers, every single reader brings something of their own imagination mm -hmm. to the book too. So that's it's everybody's different experiences. Because uh, I've had readers come up to me at events and they say, they say something about the book and it's not actually quite right. And I, I know because I wrote the book. So they're saying mm -hmm. when this happened or, the, or they even, even described, you know, and she she had dark hair, and I'm thinking, no, she didn't. But um, that's because it's something some, from their own life. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something wonderful about that. That it's their my imagination, their imagination, come together to create something quite different. Do you think about your plots or the path of your characters beyond the last page of your book? Like, do you, in your mind, does the story go on? Do you envision like where they would be? And I'm thinking like specifically kind of with a situation like with Big Little Lies, it had a season two, it kind of, they took on, you know, a, a sequel essentially. And um, I'm just kind of curious if you think about, and like with Nine Perfect Strangers, like what happens? And like, sometimes you do epilogues, but there's still a lot of time after that. Like what happens to those characters? Is that anything that kind of comes to your mind when you're writing or thinking about your books? Yeah, not that often, because normally I've put them through, I've put my characters through such a lot 
uh, <laughs> and so I feel like I couldn't but I prefer to think of them now they're okay now uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I did with season two of Big Little Lies I, I that was the first time ever that I um, because I wrote that uh, sort of a novella mm-hmm. uh, but in that case I definitely wrote I wrote with the show in mind, so I I wrote with um, Nicole Celeste and Reese's um, mm. Madeline. Uh, mm-hmm. I wrote with an American accent. Uh, oh my so god! I, yeah, and I actually changed some of the backstories of my own book, so I changed my own book to suit um, oh. to suit the show. Um, so that felt quite different. Um, and every now and then, especially right towards the end of a book, I find it hard to let. Go. so you know even when you were talking about tennis before if you'd said something then I, then I would be thinking and even when you were talking about parents in um in the U.S. then I was thinking oh should I lean in more into that side of Stan so I'm constantly sort of thinking um and sometimes a little sentence will come to me um even uh I might see somebody who looks I always remember walking down the street and seeing some uh, lady walking by and thinking, "You're that's Joy. You look exactly mm-hmm. like Joy in my, uh, the way I described her in the book." So it, it's all still very much in my mind. But once I start something new, then um, that's it. They're gone. They're gone. Yeah, how do you decide, kind of like wh- what revision is the last revision? If that is, you know, that's if that is happening. At what point do you tell yourself, okay, this is the final, <laughs> the final version of the book, and if I keep thinking of things, I'm going to just start the next one, and I'm going to just sign off. Well, it's the deadline, so yeah. um, I have a deadline <laughs> that I've, I've, I've promised, um, <laughs> and so that, in a way, because especially I'm, I really loved writing this particular book. I felt like I could have kept writing it forever, and so there was a, I felt sad, but the th- when you very first deliver your manuscript you know that you've got the editorial process to go through so you'll still spend more time with the characters and then there's normally the copy editing stage so actually by the the final stage I can't stand to to think about the actual manuscript so it has been but because it's been a few months now now I'm still thinking and I haven't got any I've got nothing I haven't got an idea for my next book so they're still the characters at the the top of my mind. Mm. Um, Do you have, um, I'm so curious, kind of, you were mentioning, I think you said this, that you don't plan out your books. You just Mm. kind of, I believe that's like, you're a pantser. Do you have that? Do you have the Potter versus pantser? Are you, people use that in the the States kind of like fly by the seat of your pants? Yes, we definitely, we definitely. Um, Is, so do your plot like do you surprise yourself then as you're kind of going along especially since so many of your books have twists and kind of reveals and things that it would seem like if I were reading this book I would imagine the author kind of spending years almost plotting out the way it goes because it seems so intricate in the plot so kind of how like what is your process then and do you ever like have moments where you think, oh, wow, I can't believe that that's what happened or things like that? Uh, definitely. So um, because I, I've never planned out uh, a book. Uh, and so I, different, I definitely have, um, I definitely have, I'm surprised. Uh, um, so I can always remember my sisters <laughs> saying with Big Little Lies, saying, oh, I was surprised when that happened. And I said, yeah, I was surprised too. <laughs> uh, and it was so that's why I always I always resist the idea of of um, people thinking there will always be a twist in my books because the twists can't, um, sneak up on me. So I never want to think, oh, I hope I, you know, I hope there's going to be a twist or or feel that uh, um, it's forced. And I can remember with the husband's secret, I can always remember the exact. Uh, intersection I was sitting at in my car when I finally worked out how I would pull together because I had these three sort of storylines um, and the relief that mm. I, um, I'd i worked it out uh, so that's why I always hate when people say um, if you read a review that says oh, I was so predictable I think well I don't know how you could predict could it I, I couldn't <laughs> predict it <laughs> it was hard for me you're very clever um, 
Uh, and so with this one, I, I knew I wanted to have, um, uh, it's with Joy and Stan that somebody knocks on their door late at night. And that came from an actual newspaper story that I'd read where an elderly couple had somebody turned up on their doorstep late at night. And I, so this was the character of Savannah. And I didn't know how, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know what the implications of her turning up would be. I just start writing that very first chapter oh, wow. with the knock on the door. And then at, through the process of writing, um, it comes to me, which I never want to give the impression that that means it all just sort of comes, you know, it just flows into my head. It's not like that at all. I'm working it out as I go okay. along. Uh, and it means that I always have a, a document which is called Things I Need to Fix uh, because once I know, okay, she's this, then I'm therefore now going to have to go back in and signpost this. I'm going to have to go back in and put uh red herrings here mm -hmm. and some things I don't so especially with um, apples never fall there are little things that I didn't know um were significant until later or I, I thought later oh okay this could have been uh, this could have meant something and I love it when that happens because then it I don't feel I have to sort of jam it into the story it just mm -hmm. it happens to to flow so does that mean that you don't know kind of the the ending or the answer? You know, a lot of your books kind of set up a question, it, you know, in, in Apples Never Fall. It's like, what happens to Joy? Where did she go? Things like that. When are you kind of, is that, do you have that answer at the very least? Like where, you know, where she, not even where she went or kind of the, like the details of it, but even like did she go missing or did she run away or things like that? Are you, you don't decide that at the beginning either. You're really. No, uh, no, definitely, definitely not. Um, I know with the husband's secret, well, which is there's a, 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 a whole lot of the book is um, she opens a letter from a husband to be opened in the event of his death. And I did know with that one, what the letter said, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, I didn't know the, um, the consequences of that being revealed and with apples never fall I did not know I didn't know where she was um, so it's it's a fun way to write because you, know, you sit down at your computer and you're thinking I wonder what's going to happen but mm -hmm. it's also a terrible way to write because it, it's a constant state of anxiety thinking well where is she uh, <laughs> and and asking that question all the time or well, could it be this could it be that so I'm just constantly trying out ideas and then the relief when um that finally comes to you is is wonderful yeah are you ever able to turn off during the process of writing like the first draft of these manuscripts I can imagine like those of us who have like work nightmares where like a problem at work is kind of floating through your dreams all night that must be is that every day for you as these kind as you're kind of moving through the story um yeah I I still actually I still have work nightmares from my last corporate oh job. my god <laughs> something to look forward to for all of us it never ends <laughs> I know because mine I, I remember with my first sort of um you know 20 years ago where it was just it was a mid-level sort of corporate job and I'd wake up screaming that I'd forgotten something and then those screaming nightmares have now just relate to whatever's going on in my life so it's something it's to do with children or whatever um but I don't seem to have screaming nightmares about um books um but but I can yeah I can't switch off no I'm constantly constantly thinking um and every single thing that's happening in my life I'm wondering how how could that every every as I say you know I saw that lady walking down the street so it's good it, I find it sort of stimulating um the, and everything's material mm -hmm. um I just thought of a, a part that reminded me of uh, that you reminded me of in the book where joy she wakes up one morning like panicked that she didn't take one of the kids to school i think or like forgot to bring one of the kids and then it's like wait they're adults um, <laughs> yes well that's me that's me because my dreams are always i've forgotten something of you you know my when i had a baby had a baby my dream was i forgot that i've had a baby i've just forgotten 
existence <laughs> baby. It's a terror. Don't get it into your head. It's a terrible dream. <laughs> I've had a, I don't have a baby and I've had a dream that I have a baby that I forgot. So oh, I really? <laughs> no, no, you'll be susceptible to it. Then you are I know, I think that it's already starting. It's already yeah. starting. Um, so you have obviously so many, especially by now, like obsessive readers, fan base, etc. And I would imagine that you have a fair amount of experience talking to them about kind of their reactions to all of the books and what they connect to and what they don't like, do you write with your readers like in my, are they in the back of your head or are you able to kind of shut off the idea of an audience and kind of get that voice away while you're writing? Um, I think I do. Uh, I think I have to put them out of my head because um, because I think it's human nature that the more negative comments are the ones that um, that I'll remember. So, and if I get caught the, those negative voices in my head, then um, then I'll start um, I'll start thinking. Oh no! And especially, you know, people say say, "Oh, she's so." Uh, about a particular character they'll say she's so whiny or something like that and then I'm thinking oh no no don't be whiny as I'm writing a particular mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to put that out of my head and it's even important to put the positive comments so you know when I was saying about the the twists people loving the twists because then uh <clears throat> as I said I don't want to start obsessing I, I must have a twist mm -hmm. uh so I know I think I successfully put them out of my head it's hard it's hard in the beginning when I first start writing a book then um uh, before I get to know my characters and before I'm caught up in the story myself then I might hear all those voices in the back of my head um, but once I I know and love my characters and the story has momentum then uh then I'm okay and then I don't hear I don't hear anything and that's the best part of writing um, when I'm losing my sense of self uh, I'm just in the story. I know a lot of authors kind of love the feeling. And I think you said this too, like when people, when a reader brings kind of their own version of the story to the, to the mm. book. Um, but I'm wondering if anything sticks out to you as kind of either like a favorite reaction or like take on any of your recent books, like whether there are patterns to kind of what people connect to. Um, like, I think it, like anecdotally for me, I remember in Big Little Lies, people loving Madeline so much and wanting to constantly talk about kind of like her <laughs> personality and like how almost, even though she's kind of crazy sometimes, like aspiring her level of just like, truly just doing what I'm doing, what she wants and things like that. Like, I feel like I have, there are little nuggets from each book that my friends kind of react to and want to talk to, but does that, do you notice that as you're kind of promoting the books or talking to fans or readers? Um, yeah, there are all different things. So um, <clears throat> with, um, I'm trying to think if there are any that come up again, there's one with what Alice forgot um, because it's about a woman who loses 10 years of her memory. So she's, um, she's actually 40, but she thinks she's 30 and she's looking back on, uh, she thinks she's blissfully in love with her husband, but really she's got um, and no children. In fact, she's um, in the middle of a terrible divorce with three children. And a lot of women have said to me that, um, especially if they're in that, of that age, if they're in, they're in their early forties and it's really made them, look back on the early days of their relationship uh, and I, I love that that I've had conversations with their husbands uh, about that um, definitely after Big Little Lies I had people who said they realized they were in an, an, an abusive relationship mm -hmm. uh, and had got out of relationships which I um, found incredible um, there are little just little things that people said um, and then there are funny things, you know, where people say, uh, I need your recipe for banana muffins because you talk <laughs> about banana muffins so often, you clearly love them. Um, and I, so that's just embarrassing because I, I don't particularly like banana muffins. I have no <laughs> recipe. Uh, I'm not much of a baker. It's, it's more that I love the words, the voluptuous mm. sounds of the words banana muffins. Um, that I obviously have used it more than once. So there's there's tiny little things. There also, it's lovely when readers talk about um, 
often because my books are easy reads, then it might have got them through a difficult time. You know, they were in, um, you know, while somebody, a family member was sick or just through a hard time in their life. So that's really, that's really lovely for me. Uh, and I get a lot of mothers and daughters um, coming to events where one or the other um, um, introduce my books to them. And that's really special to the, um, I'm looking forward. That would be lovely if my daughter and I one day like mm -hmm. the same authors. Um, the banana muffins, it's coffee cake in, um, is, it, is that what it is? Coffee cake or cinnamon buns? What do they, what do they eat in Apples Never Fall? Oh, um, in Apples Never Fall, it's um, apple crumble. Apple crumble, that's right. Yes. Right. So yeah. does that have a significance or that was was that also no, a fun I, word I do write? like apple crumble, but I've <laughs> never actually made apple crumble. Uh, and in fact, yeah, my editor um, asked, can I um, do you have a recipe for apple crumble? Because we'll give it, we'll give it to people. So um, which I didn't, and they've they've now found one, which I said uh, that I I would have a go at making. I haven't done it yet. I prefer I prefer the eating of the apple crumble than the making one. <laughs> After kind of getting a sense for what it those kind of themes that people ask about or want to talk about, do you have any predictions for what it will be out of apples never fall that people will um, like be talking to you about or wanting to kind of reminisce on? I wonder. So I assume I'll get lots of people, lots of tennis players. Um, I assume there'll probably be something I've got wrong with tennis, but you haven't, you didn't find. There'll be some no. little, people do like, they like to tell me, um, you know, the, uh, uh, those particular flowers don't grow at that time of year, so that wouldn't have been possible. Um, and I do, I actually do love that because it shows, because when they tell you this, they, tell, they don't say you made a mistake, they make it more as, so how could that be, they, mm. they say to me, as if I'm going to. invested in the story. Yes, as if I have an answer to it. Um, and so it's almost like they're confused. That couldn't have happened. Uh, and then I have to say, well, I just made it up. It was a, it was a mistake. So that's sort of sort of lovely that they've suspended their disbelief um, so much. And that's why it is so important um, that you do get all those details right, because it, it, if a reader's reading it and it pulls them out of the story to think, no, 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 that's not right. Um, so I know there'll be some little things. Oh, um, yeah, which will, um, so that's probably the thing. If I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night screaming, it'll be about some little mistake that I've made. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, yes, tennis players, I don't know. I don't know what, what else. Oh, I know, and I've had this already, um, migraine sufferers mm. um, because of the character of, of Brooke. So um, people have already started talking to me about that. Mm, that makes sense. I think there's also a really compelling kind of mother and daughter relationship. Obviously, it's so interesting to hear Joy's like reflections on what happened with her children as they were young, as they're adults. But I did think that the story with the migraines too, kind of how she's, it's kind of haunting her the way that she wishes she had kind of like reacted more strongly to her daughter's complaints about headaches and things like that. And like that really struck me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, that would be lovely. I have I had maybe some people saying, um, yeah, my, my mother or my mother-in-law is a little bit like joy. So yeah. So that would be nice. Do you have a way that you kind of value or judge for yourself, like the success of your books, obviously insofar as like the typical way that we would judge success, you've mar hit all those markers, but I'm kind of curious, like what's really important to you in the life of a book and like what about a book's like publication and life makes you feel like the best? Uh, that's an interesting question um, because I guess it's just uh, all those comments that, um, that we were talking about. So just hearing those comments is what's important to me and um, because of COVID I won't be doing um, events so I won't get that as much mm -hmm. this time so I expect I'll be hungry for it because those are the those are the lovely comments um, so I guess it's that but also I did feel with this one that I just got a lot of pleasure from writing it um, and I remember at the end of it, I thought I loved writing that book so much. It doesn't matter what happens next. Um, and I thought maybe I'd, um, 
I'd self-actualized. I'd reached a level of enlightenment, and I and I didn't I didn't care anymore. But it's not true. As soon as uh, <laughs> I knew that it was out there, I was I was just as desperate as ever um, to hear <laughs> nice things. So I want to hear. I'm I'm the eldest child. I'm an approval-seeking person. Mm -hmm. So I want people to say, "Well done, Leanne." Um, so I I need that. <laughs> is, is there's what it, is it about this book that you think like you enjoyed it so much was it the characters was it like I'm just curious kind of what yeah what stuck out to you yes I'm, I think I think really maybe all it came down to was that I because uh, normally I have a book out every two years and this time I um, took an extra year so it's uh, three years so I had more time with it um, and I think it's a better book as a result and I think maybe because I had more time and because I don't plan it meant that I didn't have that uh, that sense of so much terror in the beginning because I was thinking it doesn't matter if it doesn't work I can throw it out mm. and start again uh, and so I think I spent more time with my characters I felt freer um, yeah I just really had a lovely lovely time writing it. Are any of your books, um, do any of them stick out as what something that was more challenging to write than the others? Um, hmm. No, I don't. No, I, um, I do remember with Big Little Lies, I'd started writing a book uh, on, and the, it was about reincarnation. And my... Uh, editor had said to me what's your uh, new book about and when I started describing it to her she said that's that's not going to work I've just bought a book with an exactly the same sort of premise um, and I know because I've now since read that book and I and because it, it was remarkable how similar our ideas were and uh, and I know and I remember thinking is it because we've both taken it from an episode of Law and Order or something um, <laughs> But I, when I actually read her book and I looked in the acknowledgements and she'd read exactly the same nonfiction book mm. as I had, and it was almost as if any any fiction writer who read that particular book would have, you know, almost automatically been inspired to write a similar sort of story. Um, so that was a challenge because I had to start again. Uh, mm. So I remember that. And so now I would never actually, now I never tell I will never say what my book's about <laughs> until until it's done. So I can't I can't remember. Yeah, I do remember the husband's secret, as I said, where, where I had those three different storylines and thinking, and I felt like I'd got to to a point um, where I thought there's no way I can bring these um, three storylines together. So um, so that's perhaps why I remember that moment with such a sense of relief. Do you, that reminds me that I wanted to ask you if you have like. Do you ever write not alternate endings, but do alternate endings of any of the books exist because of the way the kind of your writing? Do you, are you ever like pivoting on the like who in Big Little Lies? Was it someone else who killed them or things like that? Or uh, by by the or by the time you get to that, are you very um, like sure of and set in kind of the plot? Yeah, they don't just are uh, alternate endings in my mind as I'm. As I'm going along, so mm -hmm. so originally with um, Big Little Lies at the the school trivia night, I had originally thought there would be um, more than one person would die at that. I, I was imagining a big riot, uh, <laughs> and I remember a friend when I was saying, um, and she looked a bit horrified, and I can still remember the expression on her face. I was thinking, oh, okay, I'll pull back. I'll pull back from that. Mm -hmm. But no, by the time I've got to the ending, then I'm clear on what it's going to be and, and because I'm not I know some authors um they just write one draft and then another they go back to the beginning and do a second draft whereas I'm re-editing uh, as I go along so it's mm -hmm. not like I um, then try a totally different sort of ending it's all all in my head as mm -hmm. I as I go and I'm re-editing what I did the day before um or going back and, and changing things as I go Got it. Did you write uh, Apples Never Fall in, I guess, I actually know that you, you did write it after um, COVID, but did you have trouble 
um, like harnessing like creativity or productivity in that obviously reader writers like work from home or more solitarily more than the rest of us. Uh, but I'm curious like what your like process was in that time, like kind of whether you had to change or relearn any like routines. I think I was just very lucky because when COVID hit, I was, um, I really had momentum mm. with the book. So I was at a really good place. So <clears throat> I, I know some authors said, um, you know, friends were saying to me, I can't write a thing. I'm too distracted, which I completely understand um, because now I'm, you know, we're in lockdown here in Sydney and now mm. I, I couldn't imagine writing anything. Um, but because when it hit, I was, I had my characters, I had my story, uh, I was well into it. I, I actually, that was that was great because it was just a quiet time uh, and, uh, yeah, I just could get in with the book without as many distractions as normal. Mm, that, makes, that makes sense. When you, like, are looking, do you ever have a moment, and maybe you're in that moment right now where you are in need of kind of the next book or the next idea do you have things that you'll do to kind of speed along the process of that that moment where you have that idea I also imagine it's probably a lot harder when you're in lockdown you can't go to this you're not just going to the store every day and meeting people that might give you an idea for a character but yes I, I remember somebody I think a journalist said to me that um in interviewing journal, uh, interviewing authors, um, a lot of them were saying they're not getting enough stimulation from being out and about. So there's, they've got, they've got nothing, um, and so I, you know, I'm, I don't need to start anything yet. I do know I might um, with this, with my next book. So with Apples Never Fall, I had taken that year, that extra year, and I was thinking to myself I wouldn't start a new novel uh, I had in my head I would just listen to music and read poetry and um, all that sort of thing uh, and I remember saying to my sister send me some writing prompts and I'll I'll just write for the sake of writing rather than you know getting straight into a new novel and my sister texted me a little just two or three sentences and she described a bike lying on the grass underneath a tree with some apples lying next to the bike. So actually I just started writing a novel from it. It did clarify that I, I it was good this year because I was calling it the year of joy. Mm. Um, and so, and which is why I ended up with the character of, of joy. Oh, uh, cool. And it was sort of clarified for me that writing does bring me, writing novels brings me joy because I just immediately started writing um, led up so that's the opening scene of apples never fall so I have thought to myself I'll ask my sister Jackie um who's the author Jacqueline Moriarty I'll ask her to text me another prompt maybe that will get me going again for the next book yeah that's a really good idea I love that do you have a moment in your career or maybe a book from um your like collection that feels like a moment where kind of it changed the course of your career um because i think everyone you have your books are all so successful as like com in comparison to a lot of authors will have like one successful book etc is there a moment that you can remember where it was like oh wow this is i'm a famous author or anything like that it was like kind of how do you relate to that uh i think yeah because i had um it was my the husband secret was my fifth novel so before that I was um what you would call a mid-list author so I, I felt very um lucky to be published uh and to be honest I didn't actually didn't really have that much awareness of myself as a, a mid-list author I, I wasn't striving to be something more I just felt lucky that that was my job mm -hmm. um, and that I, I was still being published um, but it was with the husband's secret and I can remember being in a car park um, and I got the call from um, my American editor to say that the husband's secret um, had become a New York Times bestseller uh, and I can and my little girl um, I was carrying her into a cafe and I can remember mm -hmm. whispering into her ear Mummy just became a New York Times bestseller, uh, and that—that was—that's my goosebump 
goosebumpy mm. moment um, that I'll always remember. That that was really special. Do you um, do you have any of your novels that you are like kind of dying to see adapted that haven't been adapted yet? Is that or do you not even do you kind of remove yourself from the process of that happening and whether that will happen? Yeah, I don't have any. Um, so the adaptations have been wonderful and wonderful fun. Um, more the process of it, really, more just um, getting to visit a film set, just the pleasure mm -hmm. of that. Uh, for me, it's just been pure fun. But it's in my mind, the book is is still the end goal. Uh, and I know some people say, um, I've read Written with an Eye on the, on the television adaptation and it's... Mm -hmm honestly not true it doesn't matter what I say no people won't believe that but for me it's the book that that matters and that feels really personal to me because that's between me and the reader whereas the adaptations are involve a whole lot of other people's and or their talents um so so no there's not there's really not maybe there's some little scenes that um the Last Anniversary was my second novel, so that was written a long time ago, um, and it's set on an island um, uh, in Australia. Uh, and I don't, I don't think setting is my strength, but um, mm. but I did love the setting of that particular book, and that has been optioned, and I would love to see that setting. Um, but that's that's really the only thing that um, I mean. Not to say I'm, I love the adaptations; I'm really grateful, but I'm I'm not. Yeah, there's not one in particular that um, I'm wait I'm with waiting with bated breath for. The setting on an island does sound kind of perfect for a coat, like a pandemic era. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> film. Yeah. film exactly. Setup. The fiction. It's a fictional island called um, Scribbly Gum Island, and I have had um, readers writing saying, "I tried to get to Scribbly Gum Island. You know, they tried to look up how to get there, but it's not." <laughs> Not, it's not a real place but yeah they, they, yeah now you've got me thinking of them they're all fine yeah they escaped the pandemic <laughs> yeah it's kind of like non-perfect strangers too where it is just everyone in one remote um remote area and it's it is time to go to audience questions but i also i was struck by you mentioned like you wrote kind of this the novella big little lies imagining nicole kidman and and reese witherspoon and it is kind of funny to me as a reader sometimes i feel tempted to imagine nicole in some form as kind of like whatever protagonist of yours <laughs> I mean, a couple of times um and i it's just funny to picture you kind of like trying to push Nicole out of your head. <laughs> yes. Well, did with Nine Perfect Strangers it is true. That is um, because originally I was thinking I've got there isn't a role because I had this uh, I had a, sh a short man called Gregory. He was originally the um, the director of Tranquillum oh. House, and then I had this Russian name where she'd bidded for the rights to have her name used as a character in the book, mm. and so I changed that character. And I do remember thinking. Oh, there you are, Nicole. I can see. So that that was for her. So yes, to to fact check myself, that is true. That's the one time I did that. She did find her way in eventually. <laughs> um, okay, we can go to audience questions now. Great, thank you. We have lots of questions. Uh, let's start with this one. It's a two part question. Uh, lady asks, how important are the names of characters in your books to you, and what effort do you go into creating the name? to match the character or does the character come first and then you match it with a name? And then the second part question from the same person is the titles of your book, who comes up with them? Do they, the, over, as the book is evolving, do the titles ever change for some reason or another? Uh, yeah, so first part of the question uh, about character names. So I tend to have the uh, character first and then, I, uh, so there's there are different levels of thinking. So sometimes there's an immediate uh, name for the character. So for the character of Joy in this one, she was a joyful person. That was her name, and it and it stuck. Um, along the way, I sometimes do change characters' names because it's really important to me that uh, because I have so many characters in my books, I need to make it as easy as possible for the reader. So um, I. 
you know, because readers otherwise get confused. So I did, uh, it's important to not have too many characters with the same initials. I try to have a variety in the number of syllables. I will often um, look up babies born in the year. So um, for the character of Stan Delaney, who's Joy's husband, so um, in the year that he was born, and I look up baby names for that year so that it fits. Um, so you, it's important that uh, the character's name works for that sort of time. Um, yeah, so I'm mixing and matching as I go along. I've, so with this one, I realised I had Joy Delaney and she has a son called Troy. And then I was thinking, oh, no, they they rhyme. Is that is? And then it was, um, but Troy had stuck. His name was Troy. I really couldn't change it. Um, but then I did find myself thinking, I know I can't have Joy and Troy. I have to I can't have too many sentences where Joy and Troy are doing something together. Uh, and I had a terribly embarrassing um, with the husband's secret. I had two children, two sisters called Polly and Esther. So Polly Esther. Uh -huh. um, which uh, readers pointed out, none of my editors noticed that, they, and some readers thought I'd done it deliberately. So there's there's thought that has to has to go into it. Uh, and as I said um, earlier with Tranquillum House, sometimes characters, um, real people at charity events, bid to have their names, their real names used. Uh, and actually, that's quite sometimes that's quite lovely because then the the character evolves from there their name, as it did with Maria Demachenko. Um, and in this book, I had Simon Barrington is, was, he'd bidded for the rights at a rural aid charity. So his, um, that name just inspired a really lovely character. Um, I've lost, uh, now I've forgotten the second part of the question. I liked no, it. The novels. On the titles of your novels. On the titles, of course, yes. So, um, I often, I, I like to have a title as I'm writing and often that title's changing. Uh, you know, I'll sit down each day and I'll think, no, I don't like that, that, because it's sort of helping me work out what, what is this book about? And for a long time with this book, it was called The Year of Joy um, mm -hmm. because I was having my own year of joy and I was thinking maybe I'll do something with, with that. Uh, and I had a lot of tennis um, uh, sort of titles for this book. Uh, and I was calling it something like backspin. And then for, towards the end, I came up with Apples Never Fall. And then I was really hopeful that, because um, I have different publishers and I want them all to agree mm. on the titles. And sometimes they don't. So Big Little Lies, I wanted to call Sticks and Stones for a long time. Um, but uh, yeah, my Australian editor already had a similar sounding title. And so my um, Amy Einhorn came up with um, Big Little Lies. Uh, so, yeah, the title is important. For my very first book, I thought I was calling it, it's a book about triplet sisters, and I was calling it A Womb of One's Own, um, which I thought was hilarious. And um, I remember they were, they were horrified <laughs> before it became Three Wishes. Uh, next question. Um... How involved do you get with the adaptation um, um, of your work, uh, particularly the writing? Do you weigh in? Do you feel comfortable with changes that are deviations from how they appear in, in the book? So I uh, can always remember being asked, did I want to be involved with writing the screenplay for Big Little Lies? And I had no interest in writing it because uh, as we've been talking about uh, part of the pleasure in writing for me is wondering what's going to happen. So I already know what's going to happen. So to be honest, it makes me want to, I just can think of nothing more um, boring than adapting my own work. Uh, and I also, I think it would be a mistake for me to do so because I think I would uh, hold on too tightly. Uh, and again, as we talked about, I think it is important that it's, there are some changes made and I would probably want to resist those changes. So no, I have in each case uh, handed it completely over and just said, um, do with it what you will. And, um, you know, loved, loved the results. So, so, you know, there are some things, so for example, my Madeline in um, Big Little Lies would never have had an affair, but um, that, that was fine. That, um, 
Madeline in the HBO adaptation did have an, an affair. So uh, I've always accepted those changes. So the only time was when I did write that novella for season two of Big Little Lies and, and I enjoyed writing that, um, but that was something completely new that wasn't adapting my own work. The next question is partially related to uh, what you just said. So I'll try to weave that in here. A uh, person asks, when your work started getting adapted for movies or television, did it affect your writing of how you wrote books uh, or how you set locations or scenes? Did it, did it begin to have an impact? Uh, it, it really didn't, but I know people don't believe that but, um, so with nine perfect strangers uh, I and I knew um, the, the only time so I make sure I'm truthful the only time was when um, as I said earlier when I used that character's name uh, and I did think okay well Nicole would actually be perfect for this role uh, but I had you know long scenes in nine perfect strangers where it's a silent retreat um, <laughs> And so they're not saying anything. And I have a lot of internal monologues. So I'm, I'm actually consciously thinking I'm not going to uh, change the way I write. Um, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, and, yeah, if I was writing for television, I would obviously not have people just walking about silently, uh, caught up in their own thoughts for, for days on end. Um, so, no. <laughs> In the writing process, um, is someone, let's say your editor, uh, reading the book along the way, or do you deliver a final book um, before your editor reads it? And the second part of that question is, is there anyone other than your editor who gets um, to read early versions of your books before they go into the publication process? Uh I, so first of all, no, I, I deliver a final book, so I don't, um, I don't like the idea at all of um, somebody reading earlier pages. Uh, and I hate the idea of having to give a synopsis because I don't have a synopsis. Uh, and I would never want to um, give early pages because of my own writing process, because I am going back and changing so much along the way. So no, uh, I, don't, um, I don't give, Give it to them till it's till it's done. Till I feel it's as perfect as it as it can be. The only thing that I do do is I have two sisters, or I have four sisters, but I have two sisters who are both uh, authors, uh, and I do uh, often send it to them just at the same time as I'm delivering it to my editors, uh, and we all do the same. And really, the purpose of that is because once you've delivered, you're in a state of absolute panic. So our job in that case as sisters is really just to send each other texts within 24 hours saying this is a masterpiece, this is the best <laughs> thing you've ever written, to write just over-the-top praise so that you can feel relieved and to write the parts that they, um, you know, little sentences that, um, that they especially enjoyed. But I, because I do have different editors around the world, uh, I know I'm going to get edited. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not resistant to changes. There'll be an editorial process. So, but that I don't want to come until I feel uh, completely finished. Next question. Um, should a writer feel that their creativity should carry a message? Or if it does carry a message, is that just merely coincidental? Well, firstly, I don't. I don't think any. Uh, I don't think there should be too. I don't think there should be too many shoulds uh, when it comes to writing. So everybody can find their own way of writing. Uh, and if you have a particular message you want to convey, and that's what's going to take you into a story, then that's perfectly fine. So I think it's important to say there are no rules. Um, but for me, I. I would never want to write with this is the message I want to convey. I would think I would become too preachy and that there wouldn't be um, much pleasure in the, in the writing. Um, so for me, it's all, always about story. Um, yeah, just, just the story. Next question. I have read all of your books and I love them. Uh, I want to know more about you as a reader. 
Uh, as a young reader, who did you like and how have your reading tastes evolved over time? Uh, so, yes, I, I love to read as a child. Um, I loved, um, you know, the, obviously the Narnia books, um, uh, Enid Blyton um, was an, a British author who I loved. Um, growing up, I loved, um, I can remember getting into Stephen King as a, as a young reader. So it was really special when um, Stephen King um, said something uh, nice about about my writing um, and I think he's written the best book uh, he and Anne Lamott have written the best books on um, on how to write uh, and I think for a very long time as a as a young girl in, in fact for an embarrassingly long time I didn't take much notice of who wrote the books um, I would just go and scoop books off uh, you know the shelf at the at the library and it took a long time before it occurred to me that I should um, if I liked a particular author I could go and look for other books by that same author um, so I just read whatever books were available to me so my father read a lot of airport thrillers um, so I would take all the books from his office I read some books which were not at all appropriate for my age um, you know at, uh, I can remember reading jaws and being terrified of going into the the ocean uh and now i love well the author that i always mention is Anne tyler is my favorite author uh, and i don't well i think it's off screen but um uh amy uh, my american editor gave me a copy of the accidental tourist by Anne tyler first uh, a first edition signed by her uh and i would say i would grab that in a fire, it was um, the best present I've ever received. All right, two more questions. Um, one is on research. Um, how do you do your research? Do you, um, and how do you, how do you file it things away? How do you, give us some insights to how you research your books. Uh, I just research as I go along. So with this one, I had that premise and then tennis accidentally found its way in, which meant that then I was talking to anybody I could find about tennis. So, so you know, I can remember uh, sitting at a children's birthday party and uh, talking to somebody about how my next book I was going to be about tennis. And then somebody sitting next to me, he sent me a text saying, uh, here's somebody to talk to, you know, used to be a competitive tennis player. So I find people are... And people are so generous that, that who are prepared to talk to you about their lives and then little things that they say that then the story goes in a particular direction because of that. So I always remember with Truly Madly Guilty, which is about a cellist, I can remember talking to a cellist and she was saying, she said, I, I said to my husband, I never want to do an audition again. And so then I, I had no idea of the, you know, how terrifying auditions are. So that then directed the story. Uh, so just talking to people, um, reading, I don't, you know, my books are set right now. Um, so I, I, I do love talking to people because they tell you things that drive the story, but I am, I'm also find research. I don't, want it to stifle the story too much because if you do too much then you get caught too much in the in the facts so and you want to you, if you learn something about a particular subject sometimes the um the temptation is to tell the reader what you've learned um so that's something i have to be careful of avoiding um so i don't in some ways i don't think i'm so good at research i could never write historical fiction because i get too caught up in um do people really speak that way? I, I, and I want the story to just uh, take me away and I feel I couldn't do it. I, I love historical fiction. I don't know how people do it, but I'd be caught up in, but did they, did they really use that word? Do they even feel that way? Um, that sort of thing. All right, and our final question uh, comes from someone who uh, asks, do you have ideas in waiting that, that are possibly going to be a new novel um, that you sort of file away, or how does a new the concept for a new novel start? 
so I definitely have ideas that um, that are filed away. So, for example, I I had um, made a joke uh, at the end of um, when I was on book tour for Big Little Lies. People were saying, "What's your next book going to be about?" And I was saying, "I'm going to set my next book on a tropical island resort, and I'm going to have to do a lot of research to get it right." Uh, and I remember thinking, um, "I'll." Um, and then I remember thinking, actually, why not? Why not set a book on a tropical island? Uh, and I'd started, uh, I'd started writing something there and I'd had, in fact, I had a pair of lottery winners and they were going off to this um, uh, tropical island. And then something happened at a barbecue, which was what inspired Truly Madly Guilty. So I left my tropical island. And then when I came to Nine Perfect Strangers, I decided I wanted to send them to a health resort instead. So I took my people off the tropical island and sent them off to, I took my lottery winners and sent them to a health resort instead. So I've still got that tropical island in my head, although now there's that series, um, White Lotus, um, which, yeah, but I, that's still, I still love that idea because it's always, um, it's always wonderful to have all your characters, uh, as I did in the, the last anniversary when that wasn't a tropical island, that was more a, um, was on a river. Well, maybe I've already done the island anyway. Anyway, um, we've, we've got some way to keep your characters in a confined setting, which is why I wanted the, uh, in Apples Never Fall, to have a family business. You can do whatever you can to keep the characters together. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Leon, and thank you, Saya. And special thanks to those of you who sent in questions. Again, Leon's new novel is Apples Never Fall and is available wherever books are sold. And additional signed copies can be purchased in the link below and in the comments section. Thanks and go on gently.